Chapter Three, The Lauriston Garden Mystery. I confess that I was considerably startled by this fresh proof of the practical nature of my companion's theories. My respect for his powers of analysis increased wondrously. There still remained some lurking suspicion in my mind, however, that the whole thing was a prearranged episode intended to dazzle me, though what earthly object he could have in taking me in was past my comprehension. When I looked at him he had finished reading the note, and his eyes had assumed the vacant, lacklustre expression which showed mental abstraction. "'How in the world did you deduce that?' I asked. "'Deduce what?' said he petulantly. "'Why, that he was a retired sergeant of marines.' "'I have no time for trifles,' he answered brusquely, then with a smile. "'Excuse my rudeness. You broke the thread of my thoughts. But perhaps it is as well. So you actually were not able to see that the man was a sergeant of marines?' "'No, indeed.' "'It was easier to know it than to explain why I knew it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty, and yet you are quite sure of the fact.' even across the street i could see a great blue anchor tattooed on the back of the fellow's hand that smacked of the sea he had a military carriage however and regulation side whiskers there we have the marine he was a man with some amount of self-importance and a certain air of command you must have observed the way in which he held his head and swung his cane a steady respectable middle-aged man too on the face of him all facts which led me to believe that he had been a sergeant wonderful i ejaculated commonplace said holmes though i thought from his expression that he was pleased at my evident surprise and admiration i said just now that there were no criminals it appears that i am wrong look at this he threw me over the note which the commissionaire had brought why i cried as i cast my eye over it this is terrible it does seem to be a little out of the common he remarked calmly would you mind reading it to me aloud this is the letter which i read to him dear mr sherlock holmes there has been a bad business during the night at three lauriston gardens off the brixton road our man on the beat saw a light there about two in the morning and as the house was an empty one suspected that something was amiss he found the door open and in the front room which is bare of furniture discovered the body of a gentleman well dressed and having cards in his pocket bearing the name of enoch j drebber cleveland ohio u s a there had been no robbery nor is there any evidence as to how the man met his death there are marks of blood in the room but there is no wound upon his person we are at a loss as to how he came into the empty house indeed the whole affair is a puzzler if you can come round to the house any time before twelve you will find me there i have left everything in statu quo until i hear from you if you are unable to come i shall give you fuller details and would esteem it a great kindness if you would favour me with your opinion yours faithfully tobias gregson gregson is the smartest of the scotland yarders my friend remarked he and lestrade are the pick of a bad lot they are both quick and energetic but conventional shockingly so they have their knives into one another too they are as jealous as a pair of professional beauties there will be some fun over this case if they are both put upon the scent i was amazed at the calm way in which he rippled on surely there's not a moment to be lost i cried shall i go and order your cab i'm not sure about whether i shall go i am the most incurably lazy devil that ever stood in shoe leather that is when the fit is on me for i can be spry enough at times why it is just such a chance as you've been longing for my dear fellow what does it matter to me supposing i unravel the whole matter you may be sure that gregson lestrade and co will pocket all the credit that comes of being an unofficial personage but he begs you to help him yes he knows that i am his superior and acknowledges it to me but he would cut his tongue out before he would own it to any third person however we may as well go and have a look i shall work it out on my own hook i may have a laugh at them if i have nothing else come on 
he hustled on his overcoat and bustled about in a way that showed that an energetic fit had superseded the apathetic one get your hat he said you wish me to come yes if you have nothing better to do a minute later we were both in a hansom driving furiously for the brixton road it was a foggy cloudy morning and a dun-coloured veil hung over the housetops looking like the reflection of the mud-coloured streets beneath my companion was in the best of spirits and prattled away about cremona fiddles and the difference between a stradivarius and an amati as for myself i was silent for the dull weather and the melancholy business upon which we were engaged depressed my spirits you don't seem to give much thought to the matter in hand i said at last interrupting holmes musical disquisition no data yet he answered it is a capital mistake to theorize before you have all the evidence it biases the judgment you will have your data soon i remarked pointing with my finger this is the brixton road and that is the house if i'm not very much mistaken so it is stop driver stop we were still a hundred yards or so from it but he insisted upon our alighting and we finished our journey upon foot number three lauriston gardens wore an ill-omened and minatory look it was on a four which stood back some little way from the street two being occupied and two empty the latter looked out with three tiers of vacant melancholy windows which were blank and dreary save that here and there a to let card had developed like a cataract upon the bleared panes a small garden sprinkled over with a scattered eruption of sickly plants separated each of these houses from the street and was traversed by a narrow pathway yellowish in color and consisting apparently of a mixture of clay and of gravel the whole place was very sloppy from the rain which had fallen through the night the garden was bounded by a three-foot brick wall with a fringe of wood rails upon the top and against this wall was leaning a stalwart police constable surrounded by a small knot of loafers who craned their necks and strained their eyes in the vain hope of catching some glimpse of the proceedings within i had imagined that sherlock holmes would at once have hurried into the house and plunged into a study of the mystery nothing appeared to be further from his intention with an air of nonchalance which under the circumstances seems to me to border upon affectation he lounged up and down the pavement and gazed vacantly at the ground the sky the opposite houses and the line of railings having finished his scrutiny he proceeded slowly down the path or rather down the fringe of grass which flanked the path keeping his eyes riveted upon the ground twice he stopped and once i saw him smile and heard him utter an exclamation of satisfaction there were many marks of footsteps upon the wet clayey soil but since the police had been coming and going over it i was unable to see how my companion could hope to learn anything from it still i had had such extraordinary evidence of the quickness of his perceptive faculties that i had no doubt that he could see a great deal which was hidden from me at the door of the house we were met by a tall white-faced flaxen-haired man with notebook in his hand who rushed forward and wrung my companion's hand with effusion it is indeed kind of you to come he said i've had everything left untouched except that my friend answered pointing at the pathway if a herd of buffaloes had passed along there could not be a greater mess no doubt however you had drawn your own conclusions gregson before you permitted this i've had so much to do inside the house the detective said evasively my colleague mr lestrade is here i had relied upon him to look after this holmes glanced at me and raised his eyebrows sardonically with two such men as yourself and lestrade upon the ground there will not be much for a third party to find out he said gregson rubbed his hands in a self-satisfied way i think we've done all that can be done he answered it's a queer case though and i knew your taste for such things you did not come here in a cab asked sherlock holmes no sir nor lestrade no sir then let us go and look at the room with which inconsequent remark he strode on into the house followed by gregson whose features expressed his astonishment 
a short passage bare planked and dusty led to the kitchen and offices two doors opened out of it to the left and to the right one of these had obviously been closed for many weeks the other belonged to the dining room which was the apartment in which the mysterious affair had occurred holmes walked in and i followed him with that subdued feeling at my heart which the presence of death inspires it was a large square room looking all the larger from the absence of all furniture a vulgar flaring paper adorned the walls but it was blotched in places with mildew and here and there great strips had become detached and hung down exposing the yellow plaster underneath opposite the door was a showy fireplace surmounted by a mantelpiece of imitation white marble on one corner of this was stuck the stump of a red wax candle the solitary window was so dirty that the light was hazy and uncertain giving a dull gray tinge to everything which was intensified by the thick layer of dust which coated the whole apartment all these details i observed afterwards at present my attention was centered upon the single grim motionless figure which lay stretched upon the boards with vacant sightless eyes staring up at the discolored ceiling it was that of a man about forty-three or forty-four years of age middle-sized broad-shouldered with crisp curling black hair and a short stubbly beard he was dressed in a heavy broadcloth frock coat and waistcoat with light-colored trousers and immaculate collar and cuffs a top hat well brushed and trim was placed upon the floor beside him his hands were clenched and his arms thrown abroad while his lower limbs were interlocked as though this death struggle had been a grievous one on his rigid face there stood an expression of horror and as it seemed to me of hatred such as i have never seen upon human features this malignant and terrible contortion combined with the low forehead blunt nose and prognathous jaw gave the dead man a singularly simious and ape-like appearance which was increased by his writhing unnatural posture i've seen death in many forms but never has it appeared to me in a more fearsome aspect than in that dark grimy apartment which looked out upon one of the main arteries of suburban london lestrade lean and ferret-like as ever was standing by the doorway and greeted my companion and myself this case will make a stir sir he remarked it beats anything i've seen and i'm no chicken there is no clue said gregson none at all chimed in lestrade sherlock holmes approached the body and kneeling down examined it intently you are sure there is no wound he asked pointing to numerous gouts and splashes of blood which lay all around positive cried both detectives then of course this blood belongs to a second individual presumably the murderer if murder has been committed it reminds me of the circumstances attendant on the death of van jansen in utrecht in the year thirty four do you remember the case gregson no sir uh, read it up you really should there is nothing new under the sun it has all been done before as he spoke his nimble fingers were flying here and there and everywhere feeling pressing unbuttoning examining while his eyes wore the same far-away expression which i have already remarked upon so swiftly was the examination made that one would hardly have guessed the minuteness with which it was conducted finally he sniffed the dead man's lips and then glanced at the soles of his patent leather boots he has not been moved at all he asked no more than was necessary for the purposes of our examination you can take him to the mortuary now he said there's nothing more to be learned gregson had a stretcher and four men at hand at his call they entered the room and the stranger was lifted and carried out as they raised him a ring tinkled down and rolled across the floor lestrade grabbed it up and stared at it with mystified eyes there's been a woman here he cried it's a woman's wedding ring he held it out as he spoke upon the palm of his hand we all gathered round and gazed at it there could be no doubt that the circlet of plain gold had once adorned the finger of a bride this complicates matters said gregson heaven knows they were complicated enough before 
"'You're sure it doesn't simplify them?' observed Holmes. "'There's nothing to be learned by staring at it.' "'What did you find in his pockets?' "'We have it all here,' said Gregson, pointing to a litter of objects upon one of the bottom steps of the stairs. "'A gold watch, number 97163, by Barrow, of London. "'Gold Albert chain, very heavy and solid. "'Gold ring with Masonic device. "'Gold pin, bulldog's head with rubies as eyes. "'Russian leather card case with cards of Enoch J. Drebber of Cleveland.' corresponding with the ejd upon the linen no purse but loose money to the extent of seven pounds thirteen pocket edition of boccaccio's decameron with name of joseph stangerson upon the flyleaf two letters one addressed to ej drebber and one to joseph stangerson at what address american exchange strand to be left till called for they're both from the guyon steamship company and refer to the sailing of their boats from liverpool it is clear that this unfortunate man was about to return to new york have you made any inquiries as to this man stangerson i did it at once said gregson i've had the advertisement sent to all the newspapers and one of my men has gone to the american exchange but he hasn't returned yet have you sent to cleveland we telegraphed this morning how did you word your inquiries we simply detailed the circumstances and said that we should be glad of any information which could help us you did not ask for particulars on any point which appeared to you to be crucial i asked about stangerson nothing else is there no circumstance on which this whole case appears to hinge will you not telegraph again i've said all i have to say said gregson in an offended voice sherlock holmes chuckled to himself and appeared to be about to make some remark when lestrade who had been in the front room while we were holding this conversation in the hall reappeared upon the scene rubbing his hands in a pompous and self-satisfied manner mr gregson he said i've just made a discovery of the highest importance and one which would have been overlooked had it not been made a careful examination of the walls the little man's eyes sparkled as he spoke and he was evidently in a state of suppressed exultation at having scored a point against his colleague come here he said bustling back into the room the atmosphere of which felt clearer since the removal of its ghastly inmate now stand there he struck a match on his boot and held it up against the wall look at that he said triumphantly i have remarked that the paper had fallen away in parts in this particular corner of the room a large piece had peeled off leaving a yellow square of coarse plastering across this bare space there was scrawled in blood-red letters a single word r a c h e what do you think of that cried the detective with an air of a showman exhibiting his show this was overlooked because it was in the darkest corner of the room and no one thought of looking there the murderer has written it with his or her own blood see this smear where it was trickled down the wall that disposes of the idea of suicide anyway why was that corner chosen to write it on i'll tell you see that candle on the mantelpiece it was lit at the time and if it was lit this corner would be the brightest instead of the darkest portion of the wall and what does it mean now that you have found it asked gregson in a depreciatory voice mean why it means that the writer was going to put the female name rachel but was disturbed before he or she had time to finish you mark my words when this case comes to be cleared up you'll find that a woman named rachel has something to do with it it's all very well for you to laugh mr sherlock holmes you may be very smart and clever but the old hound is the best when all is said and done i really beg your pardon said my companion who had ruffled the little man's temper by bursting into an explosion of laughter you certainly have the credit of being the first of us to find this out and as you say it bears every mark of having been written by the other participant in last night's mystery i have not had time to examine this room yet but with your permission i shall do so now as he spoke he whipped a tape measure and a large round magnifying glass from his pocket with these two implements 
he trotted noiselessly about the room sometimes stopping occasionally kneeling and once lying flat upon his face so engrossed was he with his occupation that he appeared to have forgotten our presence for he chattered away to himself under his breath the whole time keeping up a running fire of exclamations groans whistles and little cries suggestive of encouragement and of hope as i watched him i was irresistibly reminded of a pure-blooded well-trained foxhound as it dashes backwards and forwards through the covert whining in its eagerness until it comes across the lost scent for twenty minutes or more he continued his researches measuring with the most exact care the distance between marks which were entirely invisible to me and occasionally applying his tape to the walls in an equally incomprehensible manner in one place he gathered up very carefully a little pile of grey dust from the floor and packed it away in an envelope finally he examined with his glass the word upon the wall going over every letter of it with the most minute exactness this done he appeared to be satisfied for he replaced his tape and his glass in his pocket they say that genius is an infinite capacity for taking pains he remarked with a smile it's a very bad definition but it does apply to detective work gregson and lestrade had watched the manoeuvres of their amateur companion with considerable curiosity and some contempt they evidently failed to appreciate the fact which i had begun to realize that sherlock holmes smallest actions were all directed towards some definite and practical end what do you think of it sir they both asked it would be robbing you of the credit of the case if i was to presume to help you remarked my friend you are doing so well now that it would be a pity for anyone to interfere there was a world of sarcasm in his voice as he spoke if you will let me know how your investigations go he continued i shall be happy to give you any help i can in the meantime i should like to speak to the constable who found the body can you give me his name and address lestrade glanced at his notebook john rance he said he's off duty now you'll find him at forty six audley court kennington park gate holmes took a note of the address come along doctor he said we shall go and look him up i'll tell you one thing which may help you in the case he continued turning to the two detectives there has been murder done and the murderer was a man he was more than six feet high was in the prime of life had small feet for his height wore coarse square-toed boots and smoked a trichinopoly cigar he came here with his victim in a four-wheeled cab which was drawn by a horse with three old shoes and one new one on his off foreleg in all probability the murderer had a florid face and the fingernails of his right hand were remarkably long there are only a few indications but they may assist you lestrade and gregson glanced at each other with an incredulous smile if this man was murdered how was it done asked the former poison said sherlock holmes curtly and strode off one other thing lestrade he added turning around at the door Rache is the german for revenge so don't lose your time looking for miss rachel with which parthian shot he walked away leaving the two rivals open-mouthed behind him end of chapter three